Hi, this is Craig Stocks here at Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at utahdesertremote.com and we'd love to talk to you about hosting your telescope here in southwest Utah or possibly you'd be interested in renting some time by the hour on one of our telescopes. Today we're going to look at this data for the um, Jellyfish Nebula and we're going to look at it a couple different ways. This is HOO data, so this is a simple you know, HOO image. But we're also going to delve a little bit into different ways to use HOO to create a tricolor image with uh, just two sets of data. So stick around, we'll go over that in PixInsight and Photoshop. <music> So we're going to start in PixInsight, but before we really get started, let me talk a little bit about workflow and how the pieces fit together. Uh, you're probably familiar with most of this, but if you're new to the hobby, uh, let me give you a little bit of background. The overall workflow is pretty simple, that you start by capturing data, and that could be you with your telescope uh, out at night. It could also be renting time on a remote telescope somewhere, or downloading data from a service. But you know, somehow you need to capture the data. And then the processing workflow, you start by calibrating your raw files, and that's applying calibration frames, typically dark frames, uh, flat frames, and bias frames. And depending on your software and your camera, you may or may not use all three of those. Then we integrate, or you'll sometimes hear the term stack, these calibrated frames into an, uh, an averaged master file and the master file is grouped by filter and by exposure time so for instance if you're shooting um, red green and blue filters with a monochrome camera the software will generally pick out the fact that these are different filters and it will stack the red filter and the green filter and the blue filter separately and that also means you need calibration files for the red green and blue separately um, the, the flat files are usually done by filter. The darks are usually done by exposure time. Uh, so a 300 second red uh, set of light frames would use the 300 second darks and the red flats. Once you have those, those master files uh, that have the, you know, the average data from all of the red, green, and blue, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, whatever, uh, or one-shot color, uh, then you process those master files. And we'll talk a little bit more about what goes into that processing. And then lastly, you're going to save your processed master files. And you'll probably do some final touches, either a lot or just a little bit, in a tool like Photoshop or Lightroom or Affinity or, or whatever you use for photo editing. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the details here. So calibration, I use PixInsight, and in PixInsight you use a tool called WBPP, and it can do all of the calibration of these calibrated files, and it can also do the, uh, the stacking. Now, depending on where you get your data, uh, you may get master calibration data rather than the individual files and that's fine you just feed PixInsight the master file rather than the individual calibration frames in some cases you may get data that's already calibrated so in that case you don't have to do the calibration you can jump right into integration and again you do that with WBPP but if you don't enter any calibration data either either calibration master files or the individual calibration files then it will just do the integration and if you're starting with with light frames that have already been calibrated that will work just fine. The last step then is the uh, is processing the master files and that can be somewhat involved. Uh, I do it in PixInsight. Some people like AstroPixel processor. Uh, Cyril I believe is another one which I don't have any experience with. Uh, so I'll be talking primarily about PixInsight, 
but if you're using a different tool, you, hopefully you can apply the, the same logical steps to that software. But the processing really involves a couple discrete steps. Generally, you're going to want to do something uh, to remove gradients and create a, an even more even field. Uh, two very popular tools in PixInsight are, are the uh, DBE, or Dynamic Background Extraction Tool. And a new AI tool that's very popular is Graxpert. Uh, and DBE is part of PixInsight. Graxpert is a free tool that can be used either standalone or uh, there's a, a toolbox that you can connect it to PixInsight. Uh, you may go through some form of color calibration. In PixInsight, that's the spe spectrophotometric color calibration. Uh, typically, you're going to want to do some form of sharpening or deconvolution. Uh, deconvolution is just a fancy term for mathematically reversing the blurring effect that telescopes and atmosphere and all of the various things that happen that can take away sharpness. Uh, deconvolution attempts to mathematically reverse that. Uh, it's a little bit trial and error. A tool like Blur Exterminator uses some advanced artificial intelligence tools to estimate the best deconvolution parameters. Then you'll do what's called a stretch, which is basically just brightening up the image so that you can see it, because all these images will start out very dark. Uh, you may want to do some sort of noise removal or noise reduction. And Noise Exterminator, again, is a very good tool for that. And then lastly, I like to separate the stars from the background so that I can process the stars independently from the, the nebula or the galaxy or whatever the, the star of the picture is. And again, I use Star Exterminator. Uh, there is a tool that comes with PixInsight called StarNet++. <clears throat> it has the advantage of being free, uh, but I don't think it works nearly as well as Star Exterminator. And then at this point, I save those processed files to a, a master file as a 16-bit TIFF. And then I pick that up in Photoshop to finish the processing. So let's actually walk through the process. So let me close this. Let me just minimize this. So I'm starting in WBPP, and I have already loaded in the lights, the, the tabs at the top, and you get to this by script, uh, batch processing, weighted batch preprocessor. That's what WBPP stands for. And you can look at the individual tabs for your lights, which are the, you know, your subject. In this case, it's the jellyfish. And then, in this case, I have flats. I've loaded master flats. I've loaded master darks and master bias frames. And then on the calibration tab, if you click on any one of these rows, it will bring up options over here on the right. Now, if these were color images, uh, I would check the CFA, which stands for Color Filter Array. These are monochrome, captured with a monochrome camera, so I don't check that. Uh, on the light frames, you might want to set an output pedestal, which avoids having negative values uh, when you apply the calibration. I typically use a value of 300, and then I just apply that to all light frames which means it's going to apply it to each one of these rows. The last step is to choose a registration reference. Uh, I use auto here, and then I just choose a working directory where PixInsight is going to store all of these working files that it's going to generate as it uh, goes through. So with that, I would click Run, and I have, in fact, already run this, so we'll pick it up uh, where WBP would leave off. Uh, that process takes, in this case, about 20 minutes or so to run. Once WBPP is done, we should have a set of master files, if you recall the workflow, that we can open and process. So let's look at the folder where we saved all of the working files. And here is our set of masters. So this was the folder. You'll see there's it created calibrated files, then it created registered files, 
and then lastly it created the master files and within the masters we want the master lights and there's red green and blue and we'll combine those to create a color image and then we also have oxygen and hydrogen so let's just open all of those and let me talk a little bit about what we're going to do with the data once it's open. We're going to just very quickly combine the RGB data into a red, green, and blue or RGB file. So that'll give us one color file. And what we're really after there are the stars. Because we want some nice natural color um, RGB stars. Then we're going to use the hydrogen and the oxygen to create an HOO image. And we're going to do uh, most of that creation in Photoshop is where we're going to do the color mapping. So the first thing we'll do is, and you'll notice I've got some shortcuts stored over here. Uh, and the first one is channel combination. And just very quickly, the way you create those shortcuts is you open up the process that you want. So in this case, you could go to all processes channel combination there it is and it will typically open up blank like this and to save this as a process icon over here on the right I can just use the triangle to drag out an instance change the name of this by saying set icon identifier uh, I'll just call this CC for now since I already have something called channel combination and then save it up here and store this as a save this as a blank project. So that's how you create these shortcuts over here. And what we want to do is put the red, green, and blue individual files into here. Uh, you can do that with the drop down by selecting one of the open files. In this case, we would open the the red. Uh, you can also grab the tab over here and drag it into the box. So there's the green, there's the blue, and we can now confirm we've got red, green, and blue dropped into the appropriate RGB channels. And I'll just click the circle here to apply, and it has created a new image for us. We can now close this, and actually we're done with the individual red, green, and blue. So let's just go ahead and close those there's the green and there's the red. Now, like I said, everything looks very dark when you first open it up and we'll use a screen stretch to, to temporarily brighten the image just for preview. And you will typically find when you do that that it looks, so there'll be some sort of a color cast. It may be green, it may be blue, it may be red. Uh, green is probably the most common color cast that you see but we'll want to do a few things to clean this up. So this is our RGB image, and let's just take a peek at our oxygen and hydrogen. And again, we'll use the auto stretch or screen stretch, or in PixInsight terms, the screen transfer function. This is what the oxygen looks like. And notice something odd here. Notice how part of this is black. And if we look at the hydrogen, we may see a little bit of the same thing, or we may see a lot, but you can see a little bit of a line here. And what's happened is some of the data was captured with the camera rotated a little bit. Uh, this may cause us problems as we go further along. Something I don't normally like to do, but I'm gonna do in this case, is to clean up this crop. And we're gonna do that with a tool called the Dynamic Crop Tool. So I'm going to go to Process, All Processes, Dynamic Crop. And it's called a Dynamic Crop because you can save those settings and apply them to multiple images so that they all get the same crop and that way everything will still line up. So let's start with the hydrogen where we can see this line. And I'm just going to draw a rectangle in here. And we can play with the rotation a little bit to fine tune it and try to get as much of the image as we can uh, but still avoid those areas that are going to be cut off and let's say that's what we're going to go with so 
Before I crop this, I want to apply the same crop parameters to the other files. So let's start with the RGB. The dynamic crop now has these settings. I can apply these settings by dragging the triangle onto an image. And it will warn us this is going to undo the astrometric solution. Uh, that's OK. We can recalculate it. So we'll say yes, go ahead. And we can see that got cropped. Now we'll go to the hydrogen, and we'll do the same thing. Drag the triangle over. And yes, and I misspoke. This was the oxygen. This is the hydrogen. And we'll apply this to the hydrogen. Oh, we'll just do it this way. We can just click the check mark on this one. So now that's cropped, and we've cropped away those, those nasty edges. So let's come back to the first one here, the RGB. And we want to clean up the color. And probably the easiest way to do that is with spectrophotometric color calibration. But we're going to do one step before that. We're going to use Blur Exterminator. And I have a, a saved version of Blur Exterminator that is set to correct only. So what that means is it's going to adjust the stars and clean up any star distortion. Uh, and it's going to do that so that our uh, color calibration can find stars more easily. So to apply that, I can just drag this saved icon onto the image. And this will take about 30 seconds to run, so we'll come back when it's done. Blur Exterminator has done its thing. So now let's apply spectrophotometric color calibration. And it takes a little bit of setup. Uh, since this was captured with the DreamScope, and that's using an ASI 6200 camera uh, with a Sony sensor and chroma uh, RGB and HA filters, Again, I've got a saved instance of it. But if we look at the setup, you can see that I've got the Sony sensor selected and then Chroma R, G, and B filters for red, green, and blue. So that when I apply this, it will know the, the capture parameters so it can do the correct color balance based on how the colors were captured. So again, we'll I'm, actually, I've got an error message, so let me notice this says the error, the image has no valid astrometric solution. And if you recall, when we cropped the image, uh, it warned us that we were going to lose our astrometric solution. So the first thing we need to do is recalculate that. And that's easy enough to do. We can go to Script, Image Analysis, Image Solver. And it picks up all of the necessary information as far as the right ascension, declination, date, and time, and so forth. And so we can just click OK. And it will go off and calculate the astrometric solution, which is basically the, the orientation and the exact coordinates of what this is an image of in the sky. And then the spectrometric color calibration is going to use that information to identify stars and identify the correct colors for those stars. So as soon as the, cal the astrometric solution is done, we can come back and pick up with the uh, color calibration. OK, the ast astro astrometric solution is done. So let's apply the uh, spectrophotometric color calibration. And one thing I wanted to point out as I made this video, uh, most of the time when I produce a video like this, I have already processed the data, so I kind of know where the pitfalls are. Um, and that creates a, a smoother experience watching the video. But it's a little bit misleading, I think, because in reality, uh, there can be a lot of false starts and blind alleys. And uh, you, know, you may try something and then back up and try something different. So in real life, it's not nearly as neat and linear uh, as we try to make it appear in the video. 
And so if your processing you know, stumbles around a bit and you try things and it doesn't always work the first time, that's perfectly normal. It's, it, it's not always the way it works in the video. Um, our color calibration is finished now. And let's update the uh, screen stretch and see what it looks like. And what I want to look at now is gradients. And it looks to me, see how dark this is down here? And it looks kind of bright up here. So it looks to me like there is some gradient here. Uh, there's maybe a little bit with the hydrogen and perhaps some with the oxygen as well. Uh, but there certainly is with the RGB data. So let's use dynamic background extraction to even out that background. And again, I've got a saved version of dynamic background extraction. And it's saved with these sample points already generated all the way around the perimeter. But I want to adjust where some of those are because the idea with the, the sample points is you want them to be on background areas and not on subject. So some of this area up here is very definitely uh, nebulous. So I want to either delete these, which I can do by just selecting and pressing the delete key, or just move that sample altogether. Uh, looks like we've got some here that are also, and I'm just moving them completely out of the way. There's some down here at the bottom that are very much on the uh, nebula. And I'm just trying to find areas where there's not a lot of stars. So that probably looks pretty good. I'll go ahead and hit the check mark and apply that. And then again, we'll have to update the screen transfer function. So let me close this, update the preview. And that looks more uniform now. I don't think I'm going to worry about the uh, hydrogen and oxygen, although we could certainly apply the same process to that. But what we're really after here is the stars. And we have done our first blur exterm exterminator. We've done our spectrophotometry color calibration. So now we're ready to do a final blur exterminator that was going to really sharpen the nebula. And I want to apply that to not only this color version, but also the two monochrome versions. So to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to use what's called an image container, which is basically stands for all three of these. So I can just run at one time on all three containers rather than sitting here and running you know, one after the other. So to do that, I'll right click on the background and choose image container. And let's just go ahead and reset that and start from scratch. Uh, you have the option of either adding files or adding views. And because these are open, these are views. We're viewing these files. So I'll click Add Views. There are the three that are open. And I can double click to select or double click to deselect. Or I can select all. And then click OK. And you can see that that added these to the image container. Now I can do one of two things with this. I can use this to actually create an image container by dragging the triangle out and creating a new instance. And remember this new instance has all of the settings. It basically inherits all of the settings. Or I can drag this triangle onto one of these processes to execute that process on all three of the uh, open files. So we'll actually do it both ways just for fun. So in order to run star exterminator on these three files, I'll start by grabbing the triangle down here from the image container and drag it up to my blur exterminator that uses more aggressive settings. And when I let go, it will start running blur exterminator and it'll run it sequentially on each one of these three files. So we'll be back as soon as that finishes. Blur Exterminator is finished now. So I'm going to go ahead and close this image container window because we have saved the image container settings down here. The last thing we want to do, or almost the last thing, is to run, uh, well, first we need to stretch the images. And we do those one at a time. 
And I, I do it the easy way. Uh, there are lots of tools for stretching. Uh, I have found that the way I work uh, with finishing in Photoshop, the simple screen transfer function is a pretty good way to stretch the image. And to do that, you open both the screen transfer function window and the histogram transformation. And I apply the screen transfer function, starting with the, the color image here. And I will typically move these sliders a little bit. And notice I have this linked so that the red, green, and blue are all adjusted simultaneously. And what I'm looking for is something, I want the darkest areas to be dark but not black, and I want the brightest areas to be bright but not white. Uh, and one exception to that is probably going to be the center of some of the brightest stars. And now to apply this, we have to do a little bit of a trick. We have to drag this triangle down to the histogram transformation tool, and then click on the square to apply that and the image turns white because we were, we've stretched the image now and we're still previewing it with the, the auto stretch. So we'll turn off the auto stretch and now that's what the image looks like now that it's been stretched. And let's do the same thing with each one of the monochrome images. We haven't spent too much time on these yet. So we'll again darken the background a little bit Maybe brighten, and we'll apply that, and come to the oxygen, do the same thing. Now I can position my cursor between those two sliders and use the mouse wheel to carefully zoom in a little bit. Again, we'll darken the background, brighten the highlights a little bit. Drag the triangle down, click the square to apply, and we now have stretched all three of our files. So the last thing we want to do, I'll just go ahead and close these, the last step is to apply Noise Exterminator, which will reduce noise, and Star Exterminator, which will separate the stars from the background. And again, I have process containers over here. A process container is like an image container, but it contains multiple processes. So this process container has both Noise Exterminator and Star Exterminator. And by running this image container, which basically contains all three images, on a process container that contains two processes, we're doing six things at once. So we're now running Noise Exterminator and Star Exterminator in sequence on each one of these three files, and we'll pick up when it gets finished. That processing is finished now, and you can see we have some new images that it created, and those are the star images that it extracted the stars from the background. So we have starless backgrounds and stars all by themselves. This is the RGB version of the stars, and we'll want to save this, but the, the last step I'm going to do with the RGB stars, I have one last step over here, I call it Enhanced Stars, and this also is a process container. It does two things. It has a curves transformation, which just applies a, uh, a, a fairly strong saturation curve. So you would do that by selecting saturation and then pulling the curve up to increase saturation. And then it applies SCNR. And what that does is remove some of the green cast. In the, sometimes you'll get a little bit of a green cast in some of the stars. Uh, so it turns those cyanish stars to more of a blue. And we apply that, again, just by dragging the process container onto the RGB image of the stars. And it will boost that saturation. Uh, I find when you put stars against a more colorful background, you, you need the increased saturation. So now we can save this. I'll just go to File, Save As, and we'll navigate to the folder where we want to save it. And we're going to save this as a TIFF file. And 
already have one by this name, but that's okay. We're just going to overwrite it. And I want to select 16-bit unsigned integer. So this is a 16-bit TIFF file. So I'll minimize that. Now we also have uh, star images of hydrogen and oxygen, which we're not going to use. So I'll just close these. And lastly, we'll save the starless hydrogen and oxygen. So I want to save this in that same master folder. And be sure to change the file type to 16-bit TIFF. So we'll save that as a TIFF. Again, overwrite yes, 16-bit. OK. Navigate to the correct folder. I know this is not exciting to watch. It's just part of the process, unfortunately. Yes, 16-bit. And if we want to save the RGB data, sometimes it's fun to, to use that to create an, an RGB image. So we'll just go ahead and save that as well. And there are times when it's useful. Um, overwrite, 16-bit TIFF. So we are now done in PixInsight. And before we go to Photoshop, one thing I do want to mention, uh, this data is going to be available on the Starbase um, database of image data that you can download. Uh, I have other data here, such as the, uh, the Flaming Star Nebula. Uh, but it's one of the options if you're looking for data to process. Uh, maybe you don't have a monochrome camera and you want to you know, experiment with that. Uh, this is a good place to get that kind of data or targets that you maybe don't have access to. So let's go into Photoshop. And if you've seen my videos before, you know what I'm going to do. Let's go to File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. And this is because we want to load each one of these files as a layer so that we can work with it in one document. So here are the TIFF files that we just created, the stars, the hydrogen, the oxygen, and the RGB. So this is the, the load layers dialog box. And so Photoshop will now load each one of those in. And the layers palette is over here on the right, and that's where we'll see the individual layers. And this lets us work with these files in a very iterative, visual, uh, non-destructive method of working. Uh, it, it, I, I think it really works well. Uh, we've got some cleanup that we'll want to do, uh, especially you know some of this uh, where we have reflections from the filters around the bright star. And we're basically just going to remove that uh, or hide it uh, with a little bit of creative editing. So there's our last image. So we'll do a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, I want to put each one of these layers into its own group. So Control G to create a group. This is RGB. And I'm pretty sure we'll be adding a levels adjustment to play with the overall brightness and contrast. And that's really all we're going to do with RGB, and we'll just drag that whole group down to the bottom of the stack. Next is our oxygen. So control G, label this oxygen. And we want to clean this up, but we want to do it as non-destructively as possible. So I'm going to use the healing brush to get rid of most of this bright spot, and then we'll use some burning and dodging to darken some of these other areas. So I don't want to change this file or this layer by itself. I want to do this non-destructively. So I'm going to create a new layer using the icon at the bottom. And then I'll choose 
the healing brush tool and the healing brush tool works like the clone stamp if you're used to that uh, in other words you you select a point to sample from and then you paint over but it blends in rather than just replacing the way the uh, clone stamp does so it does a, a much much more uniform uh, more realistic job got a little bit of a airplane or satellite trail up here we'll just take that out and now I want to switch so I've got a little bit of a trail over here so we'll clean these up and now I'm going to switch to burning and dodging to to finish this and to do that again I'm going to do a new layer and I'm going to put this layer in soft light blending mode and what soft light blending mode does is it lets you either brighten or darken just by painting with either a dark or a light brush so we'll change to the brush tool which you can get by tapping B on the keyboard I'll tap D to make sure we've got our default colors which is black in the foreground and white background and I want a relatively small opacity uh, something like 10 percent which you can get to either with this drop down and sliding or you can just tap the uh, the one key and that will get you 10 percent two would get you 20 percent uh, zero five would get you five percent and so forth but now we can just paint with a black brush at a reduced opacity and you can see when I paint it's darkening the layers below and it's just a matter of finding areas that are too bright and some of these are glare from stars some of them are large areas and just darkening this so that it blends in with the background and this doesn't have to be perfect but you want it to be pretty good and yeah, after you've done this for a while you start noticing uh, usually any place where there's a very round bright spot that's probably a star residual from star removal where it's uneven it's probably actually some data so there's probably some oxygen floating around out here and you may want to pay special attention along the edges this area looks like it's a little on the dark side so we'll even that out brighten this I think I want to darken this a little bit more and I'm just clicking and painting and remember we're painting on a separate layer so that this is completely non-destructive that if I make a complete miss of this I can turn this layer off and we're back to where we started I can turn both of these layers off and there's our original data uh, nothing has been changed in the original file so this is all uh, completely undoable so I'm gonna say that's probably good enough for now let's move on to the hydrogen again control G and we know we need to get rid of this big bright spot so we'll add a blank layer grab the spot healing brush make it fairly large and we'll just paint over this to mostly get rid of that and it doesn't matter a lot where you sample from because it blends the you know what you're removing with the background so that's what we've accomplished with the, the healing brush now we'll go to burning and dodging add a blank layer soft light blending mode grab the brush we're still black on the foreground 10 percent opacity and we'll darken this down and 
even it out so that it blends in. See if we have any. Don't see any other particular star problems. So that I think is good enough for now. Um, the next thing we'll do with each one of these, label this. I'm going to also add a levels adjustment. Again, this is within the group. And I want to darken the background down to where it's very dark. And what that does is increase contrast. And I'll bring the brights up to, uh, to almost white. And that looks pretty good. Uh, did I? We didn't do that yet with the oxygen, so let's go ahead and darken the background, brighten the lights. This looks a little dark down here, so I'm going to come back to my burning and dodging layer and add a little bit of white down here just to even that out. So now we're down to the stars layer. And again, we'll just drop this into a group, label the stars. And I'm going to do two things in this layer group. I'm going to add a levels adjustment layer so that I can, when I darken the stars, notice they get smaller. And we can even just darken, darken the white spot a little bit more. I'm going to add a hue saturation layer and what I want to do with this is reduce the saturation of reds. Uh, what I find is that red stars start to get too red. So we'll just pull back the red saturation a little bit. We'll put this group into screen blending mode and drag it up to the top of the layer stack. So now we are putting back the stars. We can turn the stars on and off. Uh, and we can also turn on our layers here. So let's turn the stars off for a minute. And let's talk about color. Because we have hydrogen and oxygen, and each of these is monochrome. And we can turn this into an HOO image very simply. And you may have seen my videos and seen me do this before. If I pull up the advanced blending options, which the easy way to get to that is to right click on the, again, on the group level <clears throat> to the right of the group layer name. And you can see we have, even though it looks monochrome, there actually are red, green, and blue channels. And if I want this to be HOO, that means I want H to be red. I want oxygen to be green and blue. Right now, oxygen is red, green, and blue. So if we turn off the red, we now have an HOO image where hydrogen is providing red, green, and blue. Oxygen is providing just green and blue. So the red from hydrogen makes it through, and then the green and blue are replaced by the oxygen. If we want to fine tune the color, I can add a curves adjustment layer within this layer group, and I'm going to put it in color blending mode so that I don't inadvertently change the brightness. And I can target the green curve, and by pulling that down, I can adjust the kind of the color of the oxygen to be more blue or more cyan. And that gives us a, a pretty decent HOO image. Turn the stars back on and we'll, you know you're getting pretty close to a finished image. You can see that we've got a little bit of a dark area behind this bright star. Uh, and that's because we darkened when we when we removed that halo from the star. Uh, we inadvertently made this area too dark. So we'll come back and brighten these up. Probably have to brighten it in both the hydrogen and the oxygen. Let's turn the stars back on. And may have to, may have to brighten it up quite a bit. There we go. So we're basically just putting back that... Uh, what was missing. And then we can, if we want to, we can darken around it.
Now, you might want to do some global adjustments. So to do that, I'm going to close these layer groups and I'm going to go to the oxygen layer because I want to add some adjustment layers between oxygen and the stars. And that's because adjustment layers only affect what's below. So I'm going to add a levels adjustment and then color balance and a hue saturation just in case I want them. The last thing I'm going to add is a solid color layer and I'm going to set it to 19, 19, 19, red, green, and blue, which is 13, 13, 13 in hex. And then I'm going to put this in lighten blending mode. And what that does is it creates, you know, somewhat like the pedestal, uh, the darkest pixels in this image are going to be 19, 19, 19. And now I can come to this global levels adjustment and adjust the overall brightness and get pretty close to a finished image. Let's talk a little bit about color because I promised that at the uh, beginning. And this is an HOO image. In other words, we have red and we have cyan. And when you only have two colors, you don't get the whole rainbow. You only get variations of those two colors. So let's make a color wheel. So here's just a, a simple circle uh, radial gradient. If I turn on blue, you can see it creates a blue gradient going from blue to white. And then if I turn on the red, so now we have a two color color wheel, but there's no yellow, there's no green, there's no amber. Uh, there's only blue and red and colors that you can get like magenta that are combinations of blue and red. But it's you know kind of a linear thing. You don't have the, the full set of colors. Typically, when you look at a, a color wheel, the third color is green. So when we turn that on, now we have green over here, but look at what else we have. We have cyan, we have blue, we have yellow, we have orange. We have all the colors of the rainbow now because we have three colors and not just two. And that lets us have more color depth in an image. And we have a disadvantage with the data here because we only have two sets of data. We have hydrogen and oxygen. And what we want to do is somehow use our hydrogen and oxygen data and let them interact with one another to create a third color channel. And then we can use that third color channel to give us more color depth and more, more detail in the image. So to do that, I'm going to start by turning off these adjustments so that we can see you know, just what we've got to start with. And I'm just going to grab our hydrogen and oxygen layer groups and I'm going to duplicate them. So I can just duplicate that whole group with Control J. That would be a Command J on a Mac. And then we'll put this into a group again. So this is our third color. And we'll just label this layer group third color. And we have hydrogen and oxygen, and these have already been you know, cleaned up, pre-processed, so they're ready to use. And what we want to do is somehow let these two interact with one another. Uh, the simplest way to do that is to just subtract the oxygen from the hydrogen. And we can do that by opening up our... First, I want to turn on all the colors. Now I'm going to set this to subtract blending mode. And you can see what we're seeing here. The, what we're looking at now is the oxygen subtracted from the hydrogen and it creates a whole new set of detail. So now if I go up to this third color group and let's put it in screen blending mode. And we need to add a couple adjustment layers. We'll add a levels adjustment layer so we can adjust the brightness of the screen blending mode. And then we'll add a curves adjustment so that we can play with the, the color that we're adding. And again, we'll put this in color blending mode. And typically, 
we already have red and blue, so typically what we want to play with here is green. So I'll start with the blue curve and I'll just grab the right hand side of the curve and pull it down. And you can see immediately we start getting more, more orange in here. And then let's go to the red and we'll diminish it to make it more yellow. Now let's come to the brightness and we'll adjust the brightness to play with where do we want it to have an effect. And you want to be careful you don't get too carried away with it. Um, we may even want to come back to our oxygen and make it just blue. Nope, don't like that. I'm going to go back to our HOO starting point and just let our third color add to it. So right now we're using the subtraction of hydrogen, oxygen from hydrogen to create this third color. And we can continue to play with the color balance. We can take out more red. Now there's also other, you know, we did a subtraction. Uh, there's a lot of different blending modes and you can you know, play with the different ones and see you know, that starts to look interesting with the color burn, overlay, soft light looks nice, pin light seems to have a lot of potential too but it's much too bright. So let's choose pin light. And what pin light is doing is actually adding the oxygen to the hydrogen. So these are areas where there's both oxygen and hydrogen. It's too bright, so let's tone it down a little bit. But I think that's starting to give us a, a nice look at you know, how we can add a third set of colors to this. Let's turn on our global adjustments. And if we want to play with the color balance overall, we can do that here. Turn our stars back on. Uh, we now have a, a three color. It's probably a little too strong still. Uh, we can either use the levels adjustment. I'm in this third color. We can darken it down a little bit more. And maybe we want to add some saturation to the overall image. If you want to increase or decrease the oxygen, you can come back to that group and adjust the, the brightness of the oxygen by itself. Or, so that was the hydrogen. Let's go to the oxygen. So by working non-destructively like this, you have you know, pretty much infinite capability to make adjustments um, either now or later. The last thing we're going to do, and I apologize, this has been a very long tutorial. Somebody said if I'd had more time, I would have made a shorter tutorial. Let's do something about the stars because it's an astro image, so there should be stars, but uh, there's lots of stars. So. Let's come up to our star layer, and we know we can minimize the stars just by making them darker, and that helps quite a bit. Uh, two other things we can do, and I do this with almost all images, I'll click on the star layer itself and right click and convert to a smart object. And I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to minimize or eliminate some of the smaller stars, and I'm going to do that with the under noise, dust and scratches filter, and with a radius of usually somewhere in the three, four, five range, you can experiment with it and find what works well. That just knocks down those little stars, and we can turn that specific filter off. So you can see the effect it's having. I might even increase it a little bit. Since it's a smart filter, I can just double click on the filter and change it from Let's change it to five. So I like that better. And then lastly, let's sharpen the stars. So I'm going to filter sharpen 
Smart Sharpen. And usually you don't need real aggressive settings, but we just want to restore a little bit of sharpness back to the stars. This filter takes a little bit longer to apply, but you can see where we're going. So this is probably pretty close to a finished image. Uh, you, you can tinker with it uh, you know, pretty much until the cows come home, just finding variations that you like better or worse. Uh, when you adjust one thing, sometimes you want to come back and adjust something else. And you'll find if you walk away from it and come back later, uh, your taste will have changed most likely and you'll see things you want to change. But let's stop here and just very quickly recapping, we created a an RGB image for the stars and then we took our hydrogen and oxygen monochrome images and we use those to create this HOO image, which I just turned off the third color. And then to create a more dynamic image so that we have all the colors of the rainbow, we created a third color channel through a combination of the first two. And we used that to add some of these yellow and gold highlights to get a full spectrum of color into this image. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. And with that, I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear, dark sky. Thanks.